Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the tetanus neurotoxin and uh, how it can lead to uh, spastic paralysis. So tetanus neurotoxin. Now, uh, tetanus neurotoxin also has a, another name. Well, firstly, actually, it can be denoted for short. It can be denoted TE and then capital NT for T from tetanus and then NT for neurotoxin. But its other name, uh, the other name it can be used is tetanospasmin. And this describes what it does. It causes spastic paralysis. So it is, it causes the exact opposite of the botulinum neurotoxins, which cause uh, flaccid paralysis. They stop the muscles from contracting at all, whereas tetanus toxin causes them to all to contract uncontrollably, basically. And in this video, we want to understand why. Now, uh, the structure of this video, then. I want this video to stand alone. I don't want you to have had to watch the videos on botulinum neurotoxins to understand it. So, I'm therefore going to include another bit where we discuss the snare proteins and the function of the snare proteins and how they're involved in docking and then the fusion of the vesicles. Okay, um, I'm sorry for those of you who have watched the botulinum neurotoxins, that will be a reminder for you. Okay, then what we'll discuss is a little bit about Clostridium tetany, the uh, bacterium which actually produces tetanus neurotoxin. We'll then discuss about the uh, uptake of the toxin into neurons and we'll discuss retrograde uh, transmission, uh, which is the mechanism by which um, the neurotoxin goes from the alpha motor neuron back up into the spinal cord and is then released again from that motor neuron onto inhibitory glycinergic neurons uh, which inhibit the motor neuron and then that uh, tetanus neurotoxin is going to destroy the snares within those inhibitory glycinergic neurons and stop them from releasing glycine onto the alpha motor neuron and that's why the alpha motor neuron becomes overactive and that's how it leads to spastic paralysis rather than flaccid paralysis which is the case in uh, botulinum neurotoxin. Okay and then finally we'll discuss what um, happens to you when you um, when you um, ingest or get into a cut some tetanus toxin. Okay, right. Uh, and firstly, let's just say that this toxin is the second most deadly toxin known to man, after it's second only to botulinum toxin H. Okay, so tetanus toxin then. We'll start uh, by uh, discussing uh, the snare proteins and their function in neurons. Okay, so we'll start by drawing an axon terminus. Okay, so this is the axon terminus, and it's going to be synapsing onto another neuron. Now, in order for an action potential in this postsynaptic neuron to result in an action potential in the post, sorry, this is the presynaptic neuron, uh, in order for an action potential in the presynaptic ne neuron to result in an action potential in this postsynaptic neuron that I'm drawing here now, uh, what we need is for um, when it is for neurotransmitter to be released from this axon terminal here in response to an action potential making its way down to the axon terminal. Okay, so we're going to look at the mechanisms that underlie that. So, basically, what happens is firstly you make the synaptic vesicles. So you make these vesicles inside the presynaptic neuron which are full up of neurotransmitter. Now, the first thing which has to happen is, long before the action potential ever comes around, what has to happen is you have to dock these vesicles at the uh, membrane of the presynaptic neuron here, uh, in what's known as the active zone, so that when an action potential does come along, they are sitting there ready to be released. And all you have to do now is fuse the membrane. You have to finish the process of mounting them on the membrane so that they actually fuse. Okay, right. So, this, um, this sort of um, store of vesicles in what's known as the active zone of the presynaptic neuron, so this is known as the active zone, the portion of the uh, presynaptic neuron which faces onto the synaptic cleft. 
Uh, so this portion would not be the active zone, this is the active zone here. Uh, this store of vesicles which are docked to the membrane of the active zone, this is what's known as the readily releasable vesicle pool. So this is the readily releasable vesicle pool. Okay, and when a uh, action potential makes its way along the axon to the axon terminus, uh, these uh, vesicles are going to be the first to be released. Okay, so what we want to look at is what mechanisms underlie uh, the docking of these vesicles with the um, presynaptic membrane here, and also what mechanisms underlie the release of the vesicles when an action potential makes its way into the axon terminal. Okay, right, so how firstly does this um, synaptic vesicle here dock onto the presynaptic membrane? So let's draw a bigger picture of this. Here is our synaptic vesicle, and here is our, ooh, that's a little bit far away, but never mind. Here is the plasma membrane of the neuron, so I'll just denote that as PM for plasma membrane. Right, okay, so in order to dock uh, this synaptic vesicle onto the plasma membrane, you might have guessed what we're going to need is we're going to need proteins in the synaptic vesicle to bind with proteins on the plasma membrane. Now, the proteins that are going to bind together are what are known as snare proteins. All the proteins involved in this docking are what are known as snare proteins. Now, snare stands for snap receptors. And uh, SNAP is a molecule that will bind to all snare proteins, basically. And it's involved in, we believe, breaking the snare complexes apart um, after they've done their role, basically. Okay, so snare proteins. Now, the snares that are in the membrane of the vesicle are known as V-snares for vesicular snares. So that makes sense. These are the V-snares. Uh, which stands for vesicular snare proteins, whereas the snare proteins which are in the plasma membrane, they are called T-snares, so T-snares, uh, which stands for target snares, because the plasma membrane is seen as the target membrane uh, for the V-snares, basically. It's the target membrane for the fusion of this synaptic vesicle. So these are the target snares. Okay, right. So, we want to now look at which specific snare proteins are in the uh, these synaptic vesicles and which specific proteins are in the plasma membrane. So, what actually are these V-snares and T-snares, basically? Well, in the vesicle membrane, there is a protein known as synaptobrevin, and it's specifically synaptobrevin 2. Okay? So, synaptobrevin 2. And I also want to tell you uh, another... Um, name for synaptobrevin, which you will see occasionally, and if you haven't seen it before, it might confuse you. So, uh, another name that is used for synaptobrevin is to call it VAMP, okay? So, if you see people referring to VAMP, don't be scared. Uh, it just stands for vesicular associated or vesicle associated membrane protein. Vesicle associated membrane protein. Okay, and uh, synaptobrevin 2 is the one which is in synaptic vesicles and is involved in this docking of synaptic vesicles full of neurotransmitter to the presynaptic membrane. Uh, so uh, synaptobrevin 2 uh, would be denoted also as VAMP2. So this is also VAMP2. Right, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, form a complex involving synaptobrevin 2. So I will colour in synaptobrevin 2. We'll colour it in orange. Okay, now the structure of synaptobrevin 2, it has this portion which is docked in the membrane of uh, the vesicle, and then this other portion which spans out into the cytoplasm of the cell. This is an alpha helical structure, basically, and it's going to interact with other alpha helices on the T-snares or target snares. So let's have a look at the T-snares now. So we have another protein here, which is in the plasma membrane, which is known as syntaxin-1. Okay, And syntaxin-1 has a similar structure to synaptobrevin. It has a membrane-spanning portion, and then it has this great long alpha helical region here. So I'll colour this in blue. Oops, that is syntaxin-1. Then finally, 
we have another protein that's attached to the target, uh, well, attached to the plasma membrane as well, which contributes to alpha helices. So I'll draw this in green. Okay, and whoops, and this protein is called SNAP, SNAP25. So this is SNAP25, S-N-A-P-25. Right, okay, so these four alpha helices here are going to interact to form what is known as a core snare complex. So initially, what happens is in the plasma membrane, syntaxin 1 proteins and SNAP25 proteins are going to get together and their alpha helices are going to intertwine, basically, and they're going to make this complex of SNAP25 with syntaxin 1. Then what's going to happen is the vesicle is going to come over and it's going to have synaptic brevin and synaptic brevin is going to join the fun basically. It's going to intertwine with the already existing complex and the overall uh, structure that you form, which is all of these alpha helices spun together basically, that is what is known as a core snare complex or just a core complex. But I'll denote it core snare complex. Okay, right. And specifically, it's what's known as a trans-core snare complex. And let me explain why it's called trans-core snare complex. It's called a trans-core snare complex because uh, the different snare proteins are currently in different membranes. So trans means on the other side. So uh, you can see that these proteins are in different membranes, and that's why it's called a trans-snare complex. If all of these three proteins were in the same membrane, then they would still be able to form this core snare complex, but it would then be a cis snare complex. And in fact, once the two membranes have fused together, what will happen is this membrane here will become confluent with this membrane here. So they will all be in the same membrane. So it will go from being a trans snare complex to being a cis snare complex. Now, you don't just form one of these uh, core snare complexes. In fact, you form many of them. So let's draw another one here to make the picture look nice and symmetrical. So here's another core snare complex. And I'm drawing uh, the alpha helices as though they were parallel. That is just to make it easier on the eye. Uh, they are not parallel. They will be intertwined, wrapped around each other to form these strong adhesions uh, between the synaptic vesicle membrane and the plasma membrane. Okay. And what's going to happen is as these proteins wrap around each other more and form a tighter bundle, then what you can imagine is that this is going to pull these two bits closer together, because as you can imagine, the bundle is going to get higher and higher. And indeed, what's hypothesized to happen is that they start interacting first at these ends here. This is what's known as the um, leucine zipper mechanism. So leucine zipper mechanism. Okay. So what's believed to happen is that they start interacting at these amino termini, as they are, okay? And they um, intertwine with one another from this end before. And as you can imagine, as the bundle uh, stretch, well, as they start to intertwine further and further down, it's going to wind them up together, and it's going to pull those two together. So what's going to happen is, as the, um, as the zipper extends down, it's, it really is like tightening a zip, it's going to pull these two ends together, and that's going to pull the mem two membranes together, and they will fuse. Okay, now, the astute ones among you will notice that there's a problem. Um, we didn't want them just to fuse. We wanted it to dock. We didn't want it to fuse. We only wanted it to fuse once we'd released, uh, once the action potential arrives. We don't just want neurotransmitter vesicles being released whenever. So, it's an area of active research. What stops these snare complexes from fusing straight away? Now, I'm going to present to you what's known as the clamp theory, which is just that. It's a model, a model for how this could work that has some weight behind it but could be completely barking up the wrong tree. Now, in the clamp theory, what happens is that you have a protein, basically, a protein clamp stuck in between the membrane of the um, synaptic vesicle and the membrane of the, pl well, the plasma membrane over here. Okay, now I will uh, color this in pink. 
So you'll have this clamp protein holding the two membranes apart and stopping them from fusing together, basically. Now, uh, this protein is hypothesized to be a protein known as complexin. Okay? So, the clamp theory says that the reason these snare complexes can't zip right the way down and bring the two membranes really close together is that there's this clamp protein or complexin protein holding the two membranes apart and that's stopping the snare complexes from zipping up as much as they'd like to basically. Okay, so all that you need to do in order to fuse the two membranes is remove this complexin protein, then the snare proteins will continue their zipping up, they will pull the two membranes together and that will fuse the two membranes, well the two membranes will fuse and you'll release your neurotransmitter into uh, the synaptic cleft. Okay, so we'll continue our discussion in the next video where we'll see how, uh, in the clamp theory, uh, the um, arrival of an action potential is going to leave, lead to the removal of this complexin protein.